I went to uh, the, the border of Myanmar and Bangladesh at the end of September, and my mission was to try to find a story that would really grab people by the shoulders and shake them and let them know that this was an urgent matter of what was happening. And <clears throat> we're living in a very inward-looking moment right now, especially in the United States. It seems very hard to get people's attention to focus on anything. <clears throat> and what we'd been hearing about what was going on on the border of Myanmar and Bangladesh was, was horrible, but just nobody was listening. So my job for the New York Times is to try to find a story that will, that will translate, that will move people. Um, and I like to say that as journalists, we're in the empathy generation business. We should be trying to generate empathy for others. We should be using our empathy to talk to people, to get them to open up. And then we should be wanting our readers to care about what we're writing about. So I went into the, these camps where there's a, a million people living in these horrible conditions. And I wanted to find some, some compelling story that would represent the, the bigger story. And I did some research, talked to some human rights investigators, talked to some people that were working inside the camps, and I was steered towards uh, a young woman and, and some other people from her village who I was told had experienced the worst of the worst. So with a translator, I go into the camp and I meet this young woman. Her name was Rajuma. She was about 20 years old and she had scars on her face, was very thin, very small, very frail. And we told her who we are and we wanted to hear her story. So then there's just the, the sort of logistical, practical issue of where do you talk to somebody like this in a camp with a million people and everybody's watching you as the outsider, as the journalist. You know, you track this huge crowd wherever you move. And I had a sense of what she had been through and I knew it was very personal and very difficult for her to talk about this. And so I had to find a, a space, you know, somewhat private. So we went into a little, um, like a, a sort of makeshift house in the middle of the camp and we asked the people who were, who were living there if they wouldn't mind uh, leaving for a little while while we talked to her. And I sat in this house with Rajuma and a translator, just the three of us, and she began to tell me her story. And it's an upsetting story, and I, don't, and I, and I know there's a couple little kids in the audience, um, but it's, it, this, is, this is what's happening, and this is what, what we found, and I want to share it. So she came from a village called Tula Toli, which was a majority Rohingya village, and they always had these bad relations with the, with the Buddhist people that lived nearby. And I got a sense of how deeply segregated this, these people live in, in Myanmar, that there was a Buddhist side of town and a Rohingya side of town. They didn't really interact. They spoke a different language. They had different religions. The Rohingyas are Muslim. Buddhists obviously have their, their own religion. And she told us that they always lived in fear of the Myanmar army. And in August, there was this attack it was happening all across the Rohingya area. These, these attacks by Rohingya rebels against police stations and government outposts. They were pretty small attacks, like in the grand scheme of things. You know, guys with, with sticks, maybe a couple homemade guns, um, bows and arrows, I mean, very primitive weapons. But the reaction was, was ferocious. And a few days after those attacks, these soldiers came into this village and just started burning down people's houses. And as, as, as everybody ran away from the soldiers, they began to separate the men from the women. And they made all the women, including you know, any, a female, between anybody older than 10 or 12, all the way up to, to older age. And they said, you need to wait in the river. And while these women were waiting in the river, the army systematically slaughtered all the men in the village. Cut off their heads, stabbed them, shot them, strangled them right in front of the, the the, the, the women who were waiting in the river. And once all the men were finished off, they began taking these women out of the river, marching them into houses, and raping them, and killing them. And this woman, Rajuma, was stuck in a house, and she had a little boy with her, her, her one-year-old son. And as they, as they grabbed her, she clutched her boy tighter, and these soldiers ripped him out of her arms and threw him into a fire. And she says the last word she heard were her son crying for her. And then they marched her into a house and raped her again and again. They killed her mother. They killed her sisters. She was left dead in this burning house and woke up because of the smoke. And then somehow ran out, totally naked, covered in blood, 
dodging the soldiers that were still there killing other people and made it to Bangladesh 